Hello, uh, my name is Celeste Wilkins, and along with my colleagues Isabeau Deckers and Amelia Dingley, we are representing Hartbury University in the UK. Um, with the advent of sensors and other technologies that give us access to many streams of data, we are entering the age of potentially too much information. Technology should support, not replace the coach's decision-making process. As we are a university that works with athletes in the applied setting on a daily basis, we have come up with a simple solution, a two-page focused athlete report that has the underlying data processing steps that allows the extraction of metrics that are actionable, have consequences for both performance and injury, and are rapidly understandable for the coach. We're gonna take you through our data analysis process, but really focus in on some of the most interesting insights that we found with this athlete's data. For this, we had a coach in mind, a coach that has very little time, multiple athletes spanning across a array of sports that has a good understanding of strength and conditioning and biomechanics. We therefore chose to report what we believe would be the most impactful markers for both injury prevention and performance enhancement, and ultimately the most interesting for the coach or physio. For this, we presented a power velocity profile for the squat and bench press and a technical skills profile which displayed energy transfer and kinematic sequencing for the kick and throw. We employed, um, or sorry, power is the ability to express force and athletic movements and arguably this is our most important abilities and desired outcomes when it comes to athletic development. If we're a biomechanist, we can calculate power, and we typically do this using force platforms, but this is definitely not practical when we want to look at the athlete in situ. And so this indeterminacy can be solved using Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, and by inferring forces uh, using inverse dynamics and Newton-Euler equations, we can open the door to solving for power in a way that encompasses what we want to see in coaching and also what we would like to calculate with biomechanics. So we employed three different methods of estimating and reporting power. For the squat, a free body diagram was constructed and based on the estimation of ground reaction forces as the athlete mass plus the barbell mass times its acceleration, uh, the center of mass of the athlete acceleration, we calculated joint forces and moments in MATLAB using Newton-Euler equations and then joint power and torque. Uh, for the bench press, we calculated the power as the product of the force and linear velocity. And then for the throw and kick, we explored the integration between um, XN's MVN Studio and Visual 3D, which was seamless and allowed us to calculate some of the variables using a software program that is favored by biomechanists. We will now go through our outcomes for the different sets of exercises and we will begin with the evaluation of the squats. When observing the squat performance, you can see how this athlete has a tendency to push her weight from the left leg towards the right leg. This observation is accurately represented by our kinetic outcomes as we see higher levels of muscle power produced at the level of the left hip and left knee, which is exactly where we can find the AB duct and extension muscles which does push the weight towards the other side and upwards and also we can see how the right ankle picks up most of the loading. Then going on to our kinematic findings we can conclude that this athlete has a dominant dorsiflexion in the right ankle and smaller knee and hip flexion angles in the left limb throughout the squats which again confirms that this athlete has a tendency to lean more onto the right leg. Then for the bench press trials We've represented the generated power for the different sets of trials individually alongside levels of asymmetry in height of the ball. Based on these graphs, we can clearly see how this athlete tends to push the right arm higher up compared to the left, which results in bigger negative power peaks in the left arm at the final stages of the concentric bench press phase. These findings suggest that the athlete has higher levels of muscular recruitment in the left antagonist muscles when the athlete performs the final upper bench press movements. There is a relationship between load and velocity. The heavier the load is, the slower the athlete is able to lift it. But how heavy it is, is rel relative to the individual athlete. From understanding this relationship, the velocity of the movement and the load, we are able to put together a load velocity profile that allows us to estimate the athlete's predicted one rep max. We can see here that the athlete has a linear load 
velocity profile and shows the expected trend towards her one repetition max with good percentage of coefficients of variance within the re repetitions for the bench press and the squat. However, the way that athlete is achieving this positive load velocity profile may not be beneficial. As Izzy has explained, there are asymmetries in both exercises that might compromise her health and performance. Using these tools from Xsense allows us to understand how she's achieving it, something that rotary transducers do not provide alone. In the kick, we can see variability and lower than expected foot speeds for a female soccer athlete due to variability in her technique, most notably the variability in her kinematic sequencing, which should follow a proximal to distal hip to foot sequence is evident between the kicks, particularly in the timing of the max hip extension and peak knee flexion. When there's greater temporal separation between these two events, like in kick five, we can see that there is a corresponding increase in foot speed. Variability of the hip extension torque power, muscle power here, shows that the athlete's key limitation to increasing the ball speed may be that hip extension power, and that's a great place for her to start. The figure shown here represents the mechanical energy transfer between the arm segments during the throw. If power can be defined as the rate of energy flow, this figure here tells us about the mechanical powers of the segments, but also how their timing is going to affect the sequencing of the arm, which should also follow a proximal to distal sequencing, uh, like in the kick. Negative values indicate energy transferred out of the segment, with positive values indicating energy transferred in. Positive shoulder values uh, up here in the first phases of the throw indicate those energy transferred from the pelvis and trunk rotation shown here in the image, and then a large peak of energy out from the elbow to wrist. Elbow injuries are super common in throwing sports like baseball, and the large differences in the peak power of the shoulder and elbow here could identify the athlete's risk to um, compressive forces and injury due to elbow valgus, potentially working her towards uh, increasing her power across all of the segments and decreasing the overall torque could be a good place for her coaches to uh, aim their focus. Finally, we have summarized the key outcomes in an engaging and visual way. With the addition of the option for the team to have the data exported into Excel, which all of our practitioners that we work with love, our solution offers an actionable outcome that allows the team to not only look at the athlete uh, at a given point, but also track their performance over time and make those informed decisions considering both the kinematics and kinetics of the athlete's performance. Thank you very much and we welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Um, welcome on everyone again. So are there any questions already? Robert? Yeah, I have one um, question. You use quite a sophisticated model to estimate all the joint moments, joint powers, with a lot of inputs, um, the inertial inputs, uh, angular acceleration, etc. How mm -hmm. Valid or how accurate do you think this uh, model is also based on the measurements and the model itself? Well, I mean, certainly there have been um, some studies in the literature that have looked at estimating um, forces using a, for example, a single sensor. And what I've read in the literature seems to indicate for a sagittal uh, movements estimating the vertical ground reaction forces is fairly accurate, although um, estimating, for example, horizontal ground reaction forces is not so accurate when we're using a sensor. So there could be definitely um, kind of, it's, I guess you have to weigh what you want to achieve, right? If we wanted to understand the segmental um, picture of how the forces is produced by the athlete, then this is a good way of doing it. Um, there is a little bit of a trade-off in accuracy, I guess, as well. If I can add to that, I think in this context, as we are actually, we aim to, to uh, use our report in a clinical setting. Um, and I think it's very important to look at the reliability of the system um, rather than the validity of 
for the, the accuracy. So as long as we know that within the same person, we would see same similar levels of error, then we actually can uh, use all the data and outcomes as a therapist or a coach to interpret the outcomes uh, quite um, validly. Um, and it doesn't, then it doesn't, it's as, not as important um, as in like your research setting to have like accurate data, as long as you can compare within the same person. If that makes Although, sense. Although, for example, if we were to compare our results to um, data collected with force platforms, maybe we would see some divergence from our results in theirs, for sure. Okay. Thank oh, you. Great job, and you are actually setting up my question. Um, so I am quite familiar with Visual 3D, and I've actually never seen it being used without uh, motion capture. So I'm just curious to see how the segment geometries are estimated when you don't have those markers that tell you the specific individual geometry. Yeah, well, actually, I found that the integration, um, so there were two ways that you could use Visual 3D with the XSense data. And uh, if you actually exported the MVNX file, it would uh, estimate all of the segment parameters and create the model for you. Um, and of course, you would just have to make sure that the mass and the height of the person were um, were accurate as well. Um, definitely, I think that uh, there are some limitations of that uh, estimation compared to motion capture. But in terms of ease of use for our practitioners, especially at our university, where we're very uh, we're always using Visual 3D, that integration worked really well, and I would recommend it. Thank you. Uh, I think we are uh, getting over time, so I'd like to just to finish. There's one very qu one question from the audience that I'd like to, to to ask, but it's really quick. So please make quick on your answer. Also, so very comprehensive assessment. Um, may the authors comment on the time it takes to uh, generate a report? Yeah, um, I think that with anything, when you're first getting all of your parameters together. Uh, making the scripts is quite lengthy, but now that we have it, it would be a 30 minute generation. I think the longest thing is to actually interpret it and give that value to the coaches and athletes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.